In studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Good to see you. Former editor of the journal, Maria Lawrence, and now bringer of goods from hospice. A couple of giant box bowls of snacks for this Ash Wednesday. It is, yeah. Sorry about the um, the dichotomy there of the snacks and yeah. Ash Wednesday. There, but, there's a couple of things I've always had questions about. One is, why would people bring me snacks on a day I'm supposed to fast <laughs> as a Catholic? And Girl Scout cookies always seem to get delivered right during Lent when everybody's giving up Sweets from yep, Lent, right? Yep. I've never Sorry, the it's just an unfortunate circumstance, I guess. But the 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 point was that we didn't want to do it during the Christmas holidays because everybody does that Every, then, and you just get lost point. in the in the totally gift understandable um, uh, yeah. pile, so to speak. So you do it now. Well, they're appreciated anytime, Maria. Our okay. guest in this segment is Senator Joe Manchin. He joins us via telephone. Senator Manchin, good morning to you. Hey, Rob. Good morning, and Maria. I haven't talked to you for a while. I'm hoping you're doing well. And it sounds like you all having a lot of fun. You got Bill there. You got everybody worked up. Oh yeah, we got snacks too. <laughs> snacks too. <laughs> oh boy, I, I know. Well, today's the day we start Ash Wednesday and. Stay on, stay on track. Forty days, gang. We can make it. <laughs> uh, let's uh, talk about the border first, Senator Manchin, yeah. and uh, yeah. get into the, some serious legislation that needs to happen regarding the border. That's not probably not going to happen. Yeah. Well, let me let me put it to you the, as, as direct as I possibly can. First of all, the border is the, the probably the greatest national crisis that I think that we faced or that I have faced. Since I've been here, and I've been here almost 14 years, there's a lot of turmoil around the world, a lot of uneasiness around the world, a lot of challenges we have in our country and around the world. But nothing is dangerous. Nothing is dangerous as what's happened at the border in the last three years. And I've said this. I have uh, disagreed. I have uh, spoke out uh, against uh, the border policy that President Biden has started from day one. And it's, uh, you know, basically he made a big mistake on what he tried to do. But I heard him speak about it, trying to do it in a humane way and giving people a chance when the pandemic uh, did what it did around the world, but never did anyone anticipate, and this is what they were telling us from the White House, anticipate that they would have the onslaught of people coming from all parts of the world trying to get into our country for a better better way of life. Uh, And those who are coming here for nefarious reasons and to do us harm and grave harm. So we have an awful lot of challenges at that border and it has to be shut down it has to be re-established for legal immigration and legal immigration only and illegal immigration cannot be tolerated so if you want to bring president biden and his staff they're absolutely guilty as charged but they have come to an agreement on what i think one of the most historical pieces of legislation that can finally finally secure the border and they did so knowing that all of us, Democrats and Republicans, were upset with their policy that wasn't working and making it more dangerous. And they've come to an agreement to basically to negotiate and agree. And what it would have done, the bill that we had in front of us, they picked James Langford. The most, uh, James Langford is probably one of the most sincere, uh, straightforward, moral person I've ever met in my life. Extremely conservative. When they named him, when Mr. McConnell said he will be our chief negotiator, and I saw that. I know James is a good friend of mine. I'm thinking James has a hard time getting to yes on negotiations because he's always looking for that perfect. He, it can be better, and he'll work it and work it and work it. And I'm thinking, well, he'll never get to a yes. Well, guess what? He did. And he and I spoke about this. I said, James, my goodness, I said, it's catch and release. You've got to stop that. You just can't catch people and says, we don't have enough time or personnel here to work with you, so we'll go ahead and let you go into our country, and we'll come back and, and adjudicate you later to find out if you qualified or not. And then the parole, or uh, what they call border parole. We've never done border parole before. And border parole was basically, again, catch and release. That stops. So they've shut down everything that was wrong with the border and, and put 2,700 more agents So 2,700 more agents, which is going to be Border Patrol agents and ICE agents, to go after the people that we've allowed into this country, to round them back up, make sure that we adjudicate them with more people that can, make sure they get a fair adjudication to see if they qualify. And we changed the definition of asylum. You just can't come and say, well, I got one foot on American soil, and I was threatened back home, so you got to let me in. That's crazy. So now adjudication, basically, you go through a process. 
that you're going to be looked at in your hometown country or your home country you come from, whether you had physical uh, threats or countries and upheaval and reasons why we should consider you allowing you to come here legally. And then do extreme vetting. So we can handle about 5,000 a day with the new agents. That's where that 5,000 figure came in. And people start taking it. The other side starts saying, well, you're just going to let 5,000 a day in. Nothing's done. No, nobody gets in. That's all we can process. That's the max. And when you hit that, everything shuts down. But those are people that we can keep, process them, and send them back. And out of the 5,000, if we could process, as that many would come a day just trying to get processed, they won't because they're going to be sent back. But if they did, less than 10%. So you're going to have probably in the neighborhood of two or 300 that might really qualify out of the 5,000 to get into our country because they need that reprieve. All these things were put in that bill, and it was something. And I, these are, I've never been more discouraged in my life than what I saw going on the floor of the Senate. Back in September, my Republican colleagues and friends said, listen, we're not going to do any aid to Ukraine. We're not going to help Ukraine. We're not going to help after October 7th, uh, Israel. We're not going to help Taiwan. We're not going to give humanitarian aid to people that are starving in, in places of war. We're not going to do any of that until we secure the border. I agreed with the Republicans is absolutely we have to secure our border. We have to make sure our borders are secured before we're able to help other people secure their borders. And putting them ahead of us as a priority, I won't do. So you know what? Everyone says, fine, let's go ahead and put a bill together. Well, they finally did. And guess what? This past Sunday, well, they're still thinking we think we still got movement. Everyone says, yes, it's what we got to do. Then it comes on Monday. Well, I'm, I'm, we're still considering it. And on Tuesday, I'm not sure it's great, good enough, okay? The perfect again will be the enemy of the good. And then, boom, by Monday night or Tuesday night or Wednesday, they vote against it. It was unbelievable to me. I said, these are the people that we sit down. These are people I know. They're my friends. I have all the respect in the world. And allow the fear of politics. And Donald Trump saying, well, no, don't go ahead and fix the border. Because if you fix it... I need to use that for my reelection in November. And I'm thinking, first of all, Joe Biden is guilty as charged as letting the border get as unsecured as it is. But at least he's come to the table to want to fix it. And now Donald Trump says we're not going to fix it because it's not helping me politically. That's worse than what happened. So both I'm thinking, has politics gotten to this point that we can't fix the most dangerous thing? And I'll tell you why it's discouraged me so much. I've been here going on 14 years, and I've watched everything happen. I, from the day I got here, I said that something's wrong here. I can tell you the other side's not my enemy. If you're a Republican, I have to have a D by my name and a Democrat. I don't look at any Republican as an enemy. I look at it as my colleague and friend, and we all have the same desire to make our country great again. So here we are working towards different positions of coming to a conclusion for a problem we both identify. Today... They don't want to identify the same problem because they want to use it against each other. So I saw that from day one. But I always said this, Rob. I said, we can come together in a time of crisis. And what I saw this past week with the greatest crisis we have, that's even broken down and scares the bejesus out of me where we are as a country. And that's why I'm so concerned. And so I just couldn't believe what I saw and what uh, what I saw People that, that I thought have had courage and backbone and character walked away from it. Never never saw that before. But hopefully we're back on track. We did. 20 Republicans voted with us, and uh, we passed it by 70 votes, uh, the aid package to Ukraine, which needs it desperately to fight uh, Russia, uh, and then also the aid to Taiwan, the humanitarian aid, and the aid to Israel. So that's going to be uh, much needed, but now it's going over to the House. They're saying that they don't even want to take it up, let alone let them vote on it. But I'm thinking hopefully they'll break through that jam, log jam. Yeah. That's Sen where we are, buddy. Senator, uh, you— This is Bill Stubblefield, buddy. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, Senator. I know you're short on time, but a couple of questions that you're asked frequently, uh, and they're related. Uh, one is what is the future of the No Label slash Unity Party? And the second question is what are your plans? Well, I'm going to come to my decision as quickly as I possibly can. I've been working on this. You know, people are encouraging me to run as a third party or, in, you know, as an independent. Well, I've always been an independent. You know that. No, 
no one, just because you have a D by your name or an R by your name, shouldn't basically identify who you are as a person, what you believe. You might have, uh, you know, uh, I've been uh, identified as a Democrat my entire life because my grandfather was and my father and just something that I just never looked at as being uh, either an asset or a liability. I looked at it as philosophically uh, compassionate. I said I'm fiscally responsible and socially compassionate. That's the way I've tried to govern and make my decisions. But where we are today, the country's divided. And we're trying to unite the country, and, and I don't look at it as being uh, you should not weaponize it. So everyone says, Joe, why don't you run? Uh, you know, we're not happy with either candidate. And we're looking at everything humanly possible. No labels is trying to put a platform together to get on the ballot so someone can make that challenge as a third party. That's a very difficult challenge. It's a hard thing to be able to be to do. And I am trying to evaluate every way possible. I would never want to get involved in something and be a spoiler. Uh, to where you're spoiling it for one or handicapping it for another. So if it would help one side and hurt the other, I would never do that, or vice versa. But if there was a chance that you could win it and put a team together that was basically made up of bipartisan people who think that way, whether they be a Republican or Democrat, and run as a team and start running this country in more of a centrist middle uh, portion, when you figure 55 to 56 percent of the people are identified in the center, where you might be center-left, Consider yourself a Democrat. You might be Senator Wright. Consider yourself a Republican. But basically, you put the country before your party. You never look at party making the decision on what's good for your country. You look at what's good for your country and find out how you can achieve the necessary positions and legislation that basically strengthens the country. So we're looking at that very seriously, but I haven't made a decision yet. What's your time frame, Senator? I, you know, I kept saying by Super Tuesday, you should know exactly what you have. Right now, we assume if you're handicapping it, Maria, you're assuming it's going to be Joe Biden running again as a Democrat nominee and Donald Trump, the way things are looking. And Super Tuesday usually kind of washes that all out. You find out exactly where you are because those are the majority of the uh, swing states and all that are having the early primaries. So Super Tuesday, I think by then you know exactly where you are and if there's a possibility or an opportunity or anything of that sort. But still yet, that's a tough one. That's a long haul. Senator, do you have time for another question or do you have to go? Sure, sure. No, no, Rob, we're good. We're good, buddy. I wanted to ask you quickly about the Legacy Act uh, because I know you had a lot to do with that. Oh, yeah. The Legacy Act is a Jesse uh, Jesse Grubb. Uh, Jesse Grubb is a young lady, and her dad, David Grubb, served in the legislature uh, with me way back when we were state senators together. And Jesse uh, became addicted uh, to Oxycontin uh, uh, at a very young age when she went to co- she went to, to college. And at 19, it was a tra- traumatic event in her life, and it got it kind of to the point where they were giving her uh, to help ease her pain. And with that, uh, it ended into an addiction, a lifelong addiction, overdoses, and on and on. So the family fought this and fought this and fought this forever. And then uh, she was a a runner. She was an athlete. uh, And she was uh, up in Michigan. I believe it was Michigan. It was the Midwest. I think it was Michigan. And anyway, she went to the hospital because she had uh, a problem with her leg and running, I think. And she went there for treatment. And her mom and dad went with her, too. And now David's an attorney. They went with her, and they said, we want to make sure. And she even said, she says, hey, I've had an addiction problem. I want to make sure you notify all my records that I have been addicted, and I want to make sure everyone knows that. So when they prescribe what they're doing, it does not add to my addiction. Anyway, guess what? Uh, it was never transferred to her records. And when it came for someone to basically, uh, when she was being out, let out of the uh hospital for her medical treatment, uh, the attending physician that let her out did not see it, it was not notified, not marked, and he, uh, I think he prescribed 30 Oxycontin pills for her, so in case she had pain when she went back, you know, so she was recovering. Well, you, that's a death sentence for an addi- a, a previous addiction, no matter how how much you think you've come out of it and you think you've c- cured it, you really don't, it's, 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 it's an illness. And... Uh, She died that night of an overdose. So I introduced legislation. I wanted to make sure this never happened. And my God, we fought this for four years. And it is now a legacy act where anybody that comes in and identifies themselves, say, listen, 
I have an addiction problem. I want to make sure my records are identified properly and making sure that I'm prevented from having anything that would make, make me relapse. And that's about it as simple as I can put it. But it's going to save hundreds and thousands of people's lives because this has happened. We found out more than not. And this mandates that you must identify on their record as they pass through this medical procedure, a hospital visit, or whatever it may be. So that's the Jesse, Jesse, uh, Jesse uh, uh, Grubbs Legacy Act. Uh, uh, and I, her parents have just been unbelievable hanging in there and making sure that we did this and do it and get it done right in her honor and uh, that her life is not in vain. And I think it's a heck of a legacy for Jesse to be able to help others who had the same problems that she's had. Well, we appreciate your time today. Final thought is yours, Senator. Well, I it's just, you know, we've got such a wonderful country. We really do. And we have the opportunity to make it so good. We can secure our borders and make our country safe. We have the compassion to help people around the world, help Ukraine stop Putin's aggression. And, and we have all of our NATO allies. And, and let me just talk about our allies. I know, again, that I've heard that uh, again, President Trump saying on the uh, on our NATO allies that if they don't pay their share, first of all, I agree they should pay their share, and they are. They're, they've really stepped to the table. There are some that are lacking behind, but they're coming on strong in different types of humanitarian aid, which we give them credit for, also. But in order to say, it, it leads me to believe people don't understand why we are the country that we are. We are the superpower of the world since World War II. Not because of our super military might or the super economy that we have. It's because we have other countries that have the same level and the money willing to fight and sacrifice and die with us. That's what makes us the superpower of the world. That's what keeps us the superpower of the world. And when you lose that and you antagonize all your allies without working through them through diplomacy to get them to the point. If they're not paying, then use the superpower of your economy and your trading ability to get them in line. Don't threaten them and say, we're going to let, and we're going to encourage someone else to do harm to you and your country and your beautiful people in your country. That's not America. It's not who we are. So those things bother me so much. And now people are looking. Everyone seems to be mad about something and looking for a reason to be against it. And any of you all who follow politics, the easiest vote to make is no. You can vote no all day long, and this will be the happy retirement land for anybody. They can retire here in the Senate or in Congress, but they don't get anything accomplished. And I always said this, if I can go home and explain it, I can vote for it. And I can explain the votes that I have taken. Have I made mistakes? Absolutely. But I've never made one intentionally trying to hurt anybody in this country and definitely not anybody or anything in West Virginia. But I can fix those. What you can't fix is the ones you make intentionally because you're afraid of your own political uh, being, if you will, more so than the purpose of why you're there. So the character of the people that you send in public office to represent you means everything. You might not agree with them on everything, but if they can sit down and have a conversation and tell you why they voted a certain way and give you the same facts that they had to make a determination, you might come to a different conclusion, but at least the person had a thought process. I'm just saying, well, the party made me do it. And I'll leave you with this. If you go back and look at George Washington, you know, George Washington only wanted to be president for one term. But he was afraid. I think it was John Adams and Alexander Hamilton that were feuding and everything and the politics were getting so raw that he was second term. But then he made sure that that was it. No president can be more than two terms, one, you know, two two terms. And he said in his, in his exiting, his papers, Beware of the political parties, for they will usurp the power from the people. And I see that every day. The power of the parties is more than the power of the people who are representing. What's got to be changed? And it's not going to be changed here, Rob, or your bill. It's not going to be changed in Washington. It'll be changed back home, sending the right people here for the right reason and making sure they never forget who, they are, who they're working for. But with that, I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to speak to all of our friends over in Eastern Panhandle. I sure do miss you all. We're going to do a little tour and go around and have a and have an open, you know, we're going to have public forums and people talk and think, help and reminisce about what we've done, right, wrong, and different, and try to bring our country back together. And I think we can do that by showing that West Virginia can come back together. Thank you, Senator Manchin. We appreciate your time this morning.
Thank you. Hey, Rob. Thank you all. Maria, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Take care, buddy. Good to talk to you all. Senator Joe Manchin via telephone. We appreciate his staff assisting in setting that up. And uh, uh, initially, Senator Manchin, we were told we'd have to about 20 after. So we appreciate him uh, with a few extra minutes as well to uh, extend that segment a little bit uh, uh, more there. Uh, This just in from uh, the Martinsburg Police Department in the early hours this morning, 3.08 a.m., officers from the Martinsburg PD were dispatched to the 400 block of West Race Street in response to reports of shots being fired. Officers soon thereafter encountered a male on the sidewalk in front of the Martinsburg Police Department who appeared to be in need of urgent medical assistance. Quick action was taken by the officers at the scene to provide life-saving measures to the injured male. The Martinsburg Fire Department medics were immediately called and took over the care of the victim, ensuring His swift transport to the hospital for further treatment. The male victim who was found to have suffered multiple gunshot wounds is currently in stable condition in the hospital. A crime scene has been established along West Ray Street with the Martinsburg Police Department collaborating closely with the state police to thoroughly document the area. The motive behind the shooting remains unclear at this time. There is no current indication that the general public is at risk. Uh, This incident is under active investigation by the MPD they urge anybody with information related to the shooting to come forward and contact Martinsburg Police Department Detective Bureau or the Berkeley County Crime Solvers at 304-264-4999, 264-4999. They'd like to extend their gratitude to the Martinsburg Fire Department, Berkeley County Sheriff's Department, West Virginia State Police, and the Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force for their invaluable assistance with the investigation. That was from Chief Aaron Gibbons. That email uh, just arrived uh, not too long ago uh, in my email box this morning. I was not aware of that incident, so I'm happy for the chief to release that 